Thank you very much. And uh, before we hand the word over to Matthew, who will give us a, a shorter introduction to the actual project, I think we should present ourselves here in the room. So we will be seeing us for a few hours, so it might be a nice way to start. I'll start with you. Okay, Carlos Kjonsson, I work as the research coordinator here at KMC, and I've been involved in the Darwin project from the start. Okay, my name is Jenny Petersson, and I, uh, I'm working here at the KMC, and I have been involved in the Darwin project for approximately two years, I think, one and a half. Yeah, my name is uh, Jonas Hermelin. I work as a researcher at the uh, Swedish Defense Research Agency, uh, FWA, uh, and I've been involved in, with Darwin since the beginning. That's very good. Thank you very much, and welcome to all three of you as well. Uh, another practical little aspect, if you have any questions that you want asked, then it's uh, fine to ask the questions while you're presenting. And also, if you check your your field on the GoToMeeting, uh, you can see you'll find a moderator for the webinar. And if you ask your questions there in the chat field, then I'll facilitate the questions for you as well. So, welcome all. We are still expecting uh, quite a few participants, but uh, they will drop in during the time we're presenting and we'll welcome them later on. So, Matthew, I think I shall hand the screen over to you for an uh, introduction to the actual Darwin project. Thank you. Any second now. All right, you should be able to see my screen uh, now. We can indeed. Okay, great. Um, I will not uh, spend a huge amount of time on, on, on this presentation because uh, I think uh, many of you are still familiar uh, with all the aspects, but I just to remind you of, your, of a few things and to give you a sense of uh, where we are uh, right now. Um, so Darwin, uh, we are involved in, uh, you know, designing those resilience man management guidelines and uh, associated tools. Uh, really, the, the objective is to, uh, to provide guidelines that are both useful and usable. And uh, the question of implementation that will be discussed today is, uh, is, uh, is a very important one, uh, basically uh, to, to reflect on how we, could, we went from the content that was developed here, which I will be presenting a little bit, to uh, putting it in action in, in a more uh, operational type of environment. So uh, Darwin is uh, part of a, a number of projects that are part of uh, Secure Society's uh, uh, program, uh, the H2020 program, uh, funding program. Um, we are we have nine partners. Two of them you just heard, FOI and KMC in Sweden, in Shipping. Uh, I work for Sintef, uh, and uh, Sintef uh, leads, uh, Ivan Era especially leads the, um, the general consortium, uh, but we have partners throughout Europe, uh, Car Communication in Ireland, uh, Technical University of Braunschweig in Germany, uh, Inaven, Deep Blue, and ISS um, in, uh, in Italy that you will hear from, and uh, Ben Goyon University of the Negev in Israel. Um, the, the goal really of the guidelines is uh, like, like for, for these other uh, H2020 projects is really to create those uh, guidelines that are oriented towards critical infrastructure to improve resilience and also one of the important objectives is to, to uh, provide guidelines that can evolve because crises evolve uh, in nature, in, uh, in scope, uh, etc. and because the knowledge that we have about uh, this notion of resilience also evolves and the knowledge we have about how to implement uh, aspects of resilience evolves. Uh, so that's an important project. Uh, so our primary target is really the, the, the people that have the responsibility to protect uh, the population to protect critical services, uh, but we uh, have to consider a whole uh, larger set of stakeholders in in order to. Uh, it's not just critical infrastructure operators that we're targeting. What's important in terms of our starting point is that we know that organizations uh, that are that are involved in crisis management already do a lot of things uh, and already have lots of actions to implement lots of actions to uh, manage crisis in uh, in ways that we could consider to be resilient already. Uh, but uh, we uh, that the 
diversity of organizations in the diversity of countries represent a very heterogeneous situation. So um, those guidelines want to support uh, all organizations uh, and even if they are at different levels of uh, maturity, if you will, relative to the ideas that are presented. Uh, importantly, the way we consider resilience is really as a process. So it's not something some kind of state, an organization or a set of organizations might reach uh, and might uh, need to uh, uh, to uh, to maintain. It's a process. So it's a continuous. It's a continuous uh, uh, set of actions uh, that basically correspond to capabilities that are useful in crisis management uh, or in the face of crisis. And uh, we use a, de a definition that comes from uh, Eric Onlego, which has to do with the capability, the capacity of a system to basically adjust the way it functions uh, in order to sustain um, the, the core operations and avoid uh, basically catastrophic outcomes. And this has to be possible both in uh, expected and unexpected uh, conditions. So, as you might remember, we start we started with a large uh, review of the literature and uh, uh, a lot of interviews also with uh, with experts uh, in various fields, especially in healthcare and traffic management. And uh, that that process led to the definition uh, of, of a variety of requirements that correspond to specific resilience uh, capabilities. So the development of the guidelines was basically the, the action to take those requirements, clarify them, and, and uh, basically propose uh, ways in which uh, organizations could reach the, the capabilities that are presented here. So the guidelines are uh, basically constituted of a number of what we call capability cards, which are these uh, elemental uh, objects that represent a set of actions to reach one of those uh, resilience capabilities. Uh, they are not uh, in, uh, independent from each other, so we'll, I'll come back to that briefly after. But also as part of the development of the guidelines, uh, we had to also define the whole process to actually do the development uh, of the guidelines uh, by itself. Uh, and the process had to be collaborative, had to be iterative, uh, of course, but uh, also an, an important part of uh, that process was to how involve end users in various, uh, in various roles. And the, the, the DCOP uh, that you are part of played a very uh, instrumental uh, role in that, uh, that process. Um, I will not mention the, 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 the various tools, but the, the guidelines need to be also supported by a number of things. Uh, there is the, the Darwin Wiki, which is basically the platform where there are the guidelines are, cr are created and are made available. Uh, so it supports both the development and the access to the guidelines. Um, uh, there are also training packages that have been uh, developed and there are also experiments that have been uh, done about uh, using some different kinds of technologies such as simulation and virtual reality. Uh, but these are, uh, this will not be uh, discussed today um, too much. So today, uh, at, at this date, we are arriving at the end of the project and uh, we have uh, basically a set of 13 uh, capability cards uh, that correspond to uh, those high level themes that you see in red. Um, and uh, the 13 capability cards, a number of them have been uh, have been worked on for a little while, so you might be familiar with them. Uh, but a few of them uh, have been developed uh, lately as a, as an output uh, from the, la the latest uh, um, uh, DCOP workshop uh, earlier this year. And so you have uh, things like managing uh, available resources effectively as part of the managing adaptive capacity. Uh, things like um, uh, supporting the development and maintenance of alternative working methods as part of uh, managing system failures. These are new uh, and uh, less mature, but uh, already uh, fairly well developed based on the DCOP input. Uh, so these are, these are new capability cards. Uh, one uh, one uh, thing to to uh, and I'll almost I'm almost finished is to to really show how uh, those those various capability cards which you see in the in the gray uh, boxes 
uh, really are not uh, in, in the, but independent from each other. And there are uh, all kinds of relationships uh, which are a bit simplified in this, uh, in this figure. Uh, but that's something that we try to, to leverage uh, both to help uh, people use, for example, um, you know, when when a capability card enables another one, then it might be uh, a good idea to uh, implement the interventions uh, first in, in that particular capability card uh, before the one that that is enabled. Uh, and and th those kinds so those kind of relationships can basically help an organization uh, decide on where to put resources at a given time. Um, so the capability cards, uh, what they look like, uh, they are basically, uh, they, they are um, a huge amount of content organized in a variety of uh, sections. And the first sections basically focus on the implementation. And so they propose actions to, to, uh, um, to conduct in, a, in an organization or set of organizations in order to reach the corresponding uh, resilience capability. And those actions are organized uh, in, in subsections, which are the standard uh, before, during, and after uh, an event, uh, with and preceded by a, a little bit of an introduction to give a sense of the, the general approach. Uh, there are some uh, spe special uh, uh, types of uh, information in, in this capability card. So we use, for example, the triggering questions as a way to uh, specify a little bit uh, what is important to pay attention to uh, in when implementing uh, actions proposed. Uh, and we used uh, also um, content uh, that, that has been enriched by our end user partners from uh, healthcare and the air traffic management uh, to uh, basically provide a, a very domain uh, uh, the main specific perspective um, to uh, sort of illustrate or to specify uh, elements of the actions proposed. Uh, lately, we, all, uh, we have worked also in a number of formats uh, in order to uh, facilitate the use of the guidelines. So this, this format that you see here uh, is uh, what we have called the handout, uh, which is a compact uh, format that doesn't have all of the information uh, of the, of the concept card. This, this full information is available on the wiki and is also available uh, in another format that is uh, in the works, which is, we call the book, uh, which is basically, uh, which aims to be printed and, uh, and, and put in an office when somebody has time to, to go through the full content, basically. Uh, but the handout is something that is more compact and really focuses on the implementation, uh, the implementation content. Right, and I think uh, this is it. So I'm happy to take questions uh, before we move on, but uh, that's pretty much the uh, introduction I wanted to give uh, to remind you of some of the main main points of the project and of the guidelines. Do we have any questions for Matthew? And if not, uh, thank you very much. You're welcome. You're welcome. <coughs> So uh, during the, the webinar today, we'll be moving through complexity, starting with the tabletop exercises, and then we'll move on to hear from a Darwin partner in Italy. And then uh, we'll be back back at KMT again for Yanni and Jonas to uh, talk a lot about uh, the fourth pilot in the Darwin project. But uh, first of all, I'll hand the word over to you, Kalle. Mm -hmm. and, uh, we'll discuss the the least complex way of training with the DRMG, maybe. So. Yes. Okay, thank you. So let's see, I'll change the slide. So in March, we did a workshop here at KMC with the members of the Darwin community of practitioners. Um, and we had a session involving the use of scenarios and some kind of tabletop discussions. And this was, uh, uh, we did this because we wanted feedback on the capability cards, but in retrospect, we also see this as a way of introducing the capability card to a group that hasn't um, really studied um, the Darwin Resilience Management Guidelines so much uh, so far. Uh, what we see as a benefit of this is that you could uh, develop scenarios that could be tailored, uh, tailored for a specific group, uh, or uh, 
several areas of expertise, as in the case of the Darwin uh, workshop. Uh, we had participants coming from all different fields, for example, healthcare, air traffic management, um, let's see, do you remember anything? Well, they have NGOs here today. <laughs> yeah, like <laughs> NGOs. Um, so we designed scenarios and tweaked them to um, um, make the participant uh, get uh, to get them on the same page so they can discuss and discuss uh, how they could use the capability cards to understand uh, the sources of resilience uh, let's see am i on the right slide oh yeah um so uh, and using the scenarios could be a way to uh, uh, organize the, the feedback. Uh, so, for example, we did it as uh, we presented one scenario and then had different groups uh, discussing uh, different capability cards. Uh, of course, you could do this differently if you want to introduce this to your organization, but that was a way to isolate the feedback on, on different capability cards in our setting. Uh, and to organize the discussions in the groups, we also had a facilitator in each group that um, was tasked to um, uh, make sure that the discussion uh, kept in line with what names we had and also document the discussions and the feedback that we gathered from uh, uh, those groups. Um, there is also a need of finding a balance between uh, the details of a scenario uh, to make people feel that it's realistic and start on the same page, but also not um, locking them into a, a certain uh, interpretation, so it's open for debate. Um, so this is something that could be done. I think it would be easier if you understand your target audience better, uh, and if you ha have a, a smaller target audience than, than we had, uh, but then you can uh, foresee what they will discuss and react to, and so you can uh, present them just with enough information to, to have a good discussion on this. Um, here we are. Uh, and what's really important uh, based on uh, our experience is that the participants have a good understanding of the Darwin Resilience Management guidelines before they uh, arrive to uh, such a workshop. Uh, in our case, we uh, did a handout of uh, all the material in advance so people could study it. And I think we also mentioned which capability yeah. cards they were supposed to discuss uh, during the workshops. So they could prepare and have some ideas about that. Um, because otherwise you would need a lot of starting time just to get the discussion going. Why is this? Is it because they're complex or because they're difficult topics? Uh, I think you want them to, to start right away with applying what they know. Uh, not just discussing how they interpret the capability cards, but focusing on solving the, the problems presented to them in the scenario, uh, but, uh, as we did. Um, let's see. Uh, and of course, this could be made differently if you want choose to do this approach in your organization. You could. Uh, just discuss one capability card at a time or one scenario at a time. You don't have to have a uh, workshop with several um, in a row. You could, for example, have it as a seminar series. Uh, yes, the facilitator. Well, the facilitator there is that it's important to prepare all the participants in advance, but it's also very important to actually prepare the facilitator. Uh, at, the, at the latest uh, Darwin workshop, the NECO workshop, we had a facilitator manual that was sent out in advance as well, where we were specifying and targeting what we actually wanted the facilitator to think about and uh, just be able to steer the group. Uh, so we actually, in our case, extracted the feedback we wanted for all the capability cards. 
So facilitator can be your strength, but can also be a weakness if the facilitator feels that they haven't had a chance to prepare. So an important aspect of this type of uh, workshop, this type of training, is to to prepare to prepare your staff that are going to be involved. So, yeah. And I, I think it's important also to mention that the facilitator should be um, not directly involved, so they kind of ask questions all the time to the participants. You let the group discuss, but if the group kind of um, uh, come into a position where they can't um, understand something or they discuss just one small topic, then the facilitator could steer the discussion back to what the aim uh, that you had set for. Um, so, so yes, I think it's important that the facilitator is well prepared and also has an understanding of where the discussion is going beforehand so they can adapt and, and make sure that it's a good group discussion. Um, and our experiences of using uh, this method presenting scenarios, for example, an uh, uh, upcoming dam rupture or uh, which else uh, scenarios with a cyber attack in, in the fictive uh, city of Welshwood um, is that it will trigger the participants. If you, if you target the experienced uh, crisis management uh, people, they, they will um, have a vision of uh, the scenario that they are trying to solve and will participate uh, really eagerly. So we think it's a, a good way uh, to introduce uh, Darwin Resilience Management Guidelines. It's a uh, cheap method. You could just prepare uh, some of the um, some, uh, PowerPoints and adapt either the scenarios that we use that we would share with you or write some new ones uh, based on uh, what we did. Uh, it's also an interactive method. You have the participants uh, committed to discussing and trying to solve a problem and applying what they know about resilience. Uh, and it's easy if you understand the people that you're uh, training or uh, having part of the workshop to adapt the scenario. So kind of to um, make them interested and uh, eager to discuss. Um, so, and what we will do based on our um, experiences that we had using this is that we will, in the upcoming uh, deliverable, Darwin 5.5, include the facilitator manual of the scenarios we used uh, and some points on how it could be used in your organization. And if you have any questions on um, how we use them in more detail. If you want to test an idea or something, you're happy to uh, contact us and we will uh, help you get started. Yeah. I think uh, most of you have my email address uh, already, but if not, it's stated here in the presentation and uh, this presentation will be posted on the, the Darwin homepage as well. But uh, please make, uh, do make contact with us if you have any questions regarding the facility to manual or the experiences from this type of workshop. And we also hope to have a, a more open discussion with you in a little while. Thank you, Kalle. Uh, we will hand the word over to Luca and maybe Daniele as well. Or Luca, are you, are you there in Italy? We can see you, Luca. Hello. We can't hear you, though, so you're going to be muted at the moment. Just a moment that I Hello. set up my screen. Hello. Good afternoon. Mm -hmm. OK, you should now see my presentation. We can indeed. Okay, and sorry, just a small issue with 
the projection. Okay, so um, the idea is to present you briefly uh, an overview of uh, what we did uh, in the project uh, in time of uh, pilot exercises. So how we um, implemented uh, the capability cards in specific uh, crisis management scenarios. Uh, but of course, uh, in the interest of uh, uh, brevity, I will not present uh, the entire work, uh, uh, just uh, how we organized uh, the overall set of, uh, of exercises and which was the mapping between uh, uh, the exercises uh, that we call pilots and the capability cards we use there. And then just one example of, uh, of the first pilot exercise explained a bit more in, in detail. So here is uh, the full uh, set. Uh, you know, the, the overall the pilot exercises were four. Uh, there was a big one in uh, in Sweden, on which you will be told uh, also afterwards. While the Italian ones were three. Uh, the first one uh, was made in uh, in um, mainly organized by ENAV, uh, the Italian Air Navigation Service Provider. And it was uh, organized around a, a reference scenario, we call it like that, uh, about an aircraft crashing in urban area close to Rome uh, Fiumicino Airport shortly after taking off. And this um, exercise was organized in two stages. One was on the 22nd of June and the other one uh, in October. Uh, the second pilot uh, was more focused on air traffic management, which was uh, one of the two main domains of the Darby project, and it was about uh, a total uh, loss of radar information at the Rome Area Control Center. So how the, the traffic controller could manage a situation of uh, radar loss where they cannot visualize anymore the traffic on the radar screen. This was the reference scenario. While the third one, uh, which was mainly organized by Istituto Superiore di Sanità, so more focused on the, on the healthcare domain, but still with uh, an aviation component, was about a reference scenario of a disease outbreak during an incoming flight. So there is a flight, uh, again, in this case, arriving in Rome, on which it is discovered uh, a, a person, uh, a patient, uh, which is uh, probably suffering uh, from a, a disease that can be, of course, a contagious disease. So the, all the pilot exercise was about how to manage uh, this uh, situation. So this is the, the full list. And now uh, a bit of details on uh, uh, the mapping uh, between uh, the Darwin Resilience Management Guidelines, so the uh, the building blocks of them that were presented by uh, by Matthew. So, in the case of the first uh, pilot, which was uh, the one around uh, the aircraft crashing scenario, the one in airports, we were mainly focused on the card about uh, sharing information uh, on roles and responsibilities and noticing brittleness. These were two topics. Uh, roles and responsibilities was particularly important because we were uh, following uh, uh, also an uh, emergency uh, manual of the airport in which these roles are specified very well, but it was very important to check that every, every actor there was aware of the roles and responsibilities of the other actors. Then the noticing brittleness and also the aspect of communication with the public. Uh, because the, the way to communicate uh, the, this type of crisis once it occurs is very is very critical to have also the collaboration of the general public in solving this. Uh, while the second um, uh, pilot exercise, the one uh, focusing around the, the radar loss scenarios, uh, was uh, mainly um, done focusing on two cards uh, promoting common ground. In this case, we wanted to uh, encourage common ground among different air traffic control centers in, uh, in Italy uh, because they, these centers can collaborate together in, in the management of a situation like a radar loss. 
uh, while the other uh, card was uh, the one about identifying sources of resilience. We wanted to understand how normal practices, normal procedures uh, can uh, already include a strong element that can be used to uh, by reinforcing them during uh, the manager, management of an emergency. Third scenario, the one about the disease outbreak on the incoming flight, uh, we were uh, addressing the same uh, um, capability cards as in the first scenario, in the first uh, pilot, the one about uh, the aircraft crashing. So we wanted a bit to compare the impact of the same cards, guidelines, on two very different uh, domains. Uh, because, as I say, the first one was uh, more focused on, uh, on the aviation domain, where, which is a much more structured uh, domain in terms of uh, procedures and formalism, while uh, the third one was more focused on healthcare, which is a more uh, diverse and less uh, regulated uh, domain. Uh, an example uh, from the first scenario, uh, as I said, uh, uh, there was this scenario of an aircraft crashing, just a few more elements. So the idea, uh, the, what we imagined it was an, an accident of an Airbus A321, which uh, crashes into terrain uh, and uh, following a left engine explosion. And here you have some indication of the passenger that, that I, <coughs> sorry, of the injured people, not only on the flight, but also on the ground, because the aircraft is uh, crashing onto an urban area close to the airport. And here you have other details. What was uh, interesting of this scenario is the fact that uh, despite uh, the aircraft is crashing outside the aerodrome area, uh, you are, uh, due to the, to the overall situation and to the cascading effect, you are obliged to close for a limited amount of time, the entire airport, also because you need uh, absolutely the fire brigade uh, intervention, uh, also in the area external to the airport, but using uh, the, the fire brigade, which is available for the airport. So you cannot uh, leave uh, unprotected the airport from, from the fire brigade, and you are obliged to, to close it uh, for a short time. Uh, so this is just an example of the criticalities that you have to, to face and uh, the way we addressed it, so the concrete implementation of the pilot was to uh, try to uh, convey several stakeholders that participate in the management of a situation like that. For example, the civil aviation authority, the airport companies, not only the Rome airport company, which is of course uh, very big, but uh, we will be involved also in another smaller airport, uh, Bologna Airport in Italy, to have a different perspective of a smaller airport. Uh, the air navigation service provider, which was represented by different people of ENAV, uh, the firefighters of the airport, uh, the Maritime Air and Border Health Office, which is uh, managing the situation also because uh, there, were, there are many foreign passengers in, uh, on the flight. Uh, and the regional emergency agency, so the one uh, taking care of the ambulances and all these aspects. Uh, there were different representatives of these stakeholders. Uh, overall, uh, um, there were 16 domain experts, so of the different domains, including seven from aviation, three experts of communication, because, you know, this was one of the aspects we wanted to, to address, uh, two experts of healthcare, uh, and to uh, representative of the fire brigade. While um, as part of the organization, there were five uh, Darwin members. So before concluding, uh, uh, I would like to tell a few words about uh, the way we organize, uh, again, as an example, this pilot exercise in terms of the methods that, that have been already mentioned before and the, the mapping with the, with the concept cards. So the, the event overall was organized in two days, as I said before. Uh, we had a first day which was uh, involving much more people, so all the stakeholders that have been mentioning were represented, uh, while uh, in the second uh, day, uh, at the beginning of October, there were only uh, selected stakeholders uh, and only uh, three communication experts uh, focusing on specifically on this topic. 
Uh, in the first day, uh, we organized a common post exercise, which is uh, similar to the idea of the tabletop exercise, uh, but uh, we tailored it to the participation of uh, mainly of uh, uh, managers, uh, people uh, with uh, uh, higher roles in, uh, in all the organizations, because we were particularly interested in addressing uh, uh, the concept cards to these people, as these concept cards are uh, mostly about uh, uh, a review of your own procedures guidelines, so it is important that high, higher level people uh, in the organization are involved. The common post exercise, in principle, is not necessary to apply all these concept cards. For example, the one about uh, uh, sharing roles and responsibilities, information about roles and responsibilities, when it is uh, starts to be applied uh, uh, normally, uh, should not require the, an exercise uh, like a common post exercise or, or a pile or a tabletop exercise. Uh, can be also done without uh, this kind of exercise, but in this case it served to us as a familiarization uh, session because the people had to, to meet there and to uh, discuss about uh, a specific scenario as a way to, to make uh, I mean, the, the, um, the exercise and their involvement more, uh, more lively, also to a bit, uh, uh, break the, the highs at the beginning. But of course, it served also for the discussion about noticing Britainness and also afterwards for the communication with the public. So when you do an analysis of the possible Britainness, you normally start from a specific scenario or a set of scenarios. You cannot discuss about everything, otherwise uh, the discussion becomes very abstract and difficult to, to grasp. And in association with, uh, with uh, each concept card, there was a sort of uh, exercise. In, in the first case of the roles and responsibility, we were doing a simulated meeting uh, uh, among stakeholders. So we simulated the situation in which a representative of each stakeholder was sitting around the table, as the one I've been showing the, in the slide before, and discussing together uh, uh, what kind, how would you manage this situation, which role are you playing in this uh, in these shared procedures <clears throat> that we are conducting together. Is still this your role? Uh, is there something changed in the last year, for example, that we should take, uh, take care of? Is something going to change in the near future? So we simulated this kind of meeting. Uh, while <clears throat> in the case of the uh, noticing return as car, we do, did a sort of uh, focus group allow, around the checklist using the triggering questions that you can find in, in this concept card. And these triggering questions are all useful to identify possible fragilities in the, in the for example, in your emergency plan. And the same we did with other triggering questions of another uh, concept card, capability card, the one, uh, 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 capability card 71, about, about the one about communication. And also there, with a smaller number of experts, we were analyzing this scenario of our car crashing, how they would have managed it from the point of view of, uh, of the communication. So I think I've uh, run out of, of time. Uh, if you wish afterwards, I can say something more about uh, the, the findings, example of findings uh, uh, from this scenario, but I think now it's better to to stop, otherwise I take too much of your uh, of your time. Thank you very much, uh, Luca. Do we have any questions for Luca straight away while we have you in picture? Not just now. In that case, uh, thank you very much, Luca. We'll get back to you when we start the discussions in a little while. Okay, um, hand, uh, hand the screen and word over to Jenny and Jonas. Just hang on a second. Sorry about that. 
Ja, ja, so. Dus toe kan vervolgens. Ik heb het, ja. Ik heb een klikje op al van de gast. Ja, ja. Oké, there we go. Thank you very much. Oké, okay, we are going to talk about the Swedish pilot 4. Uh, and we're calling it going from the DRMG to operative use. And the Swedish pilot uh, carried out here in Linköping by KMC and FOI used the method that combines uh, education, training and exercise. The pilot was taken, uh, was conducted in uh, from the May to September last year, so it was over a period of time. Uh, and the combination of using lectures, workshops, uh, command uh, post uh, exercises, tabletop exercises is something that we are used uh, to do in at the KNC. Uh, for example, we use that mix uh, in our courses where we use when we find that the theoretical aspects combined with uh, the implementation. Uh, through exercises is one of our success factors. So that's why we were choosing this uh, setup. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so the background to the approach that we took in uh, pilot form uh, was to uh, slowly introduce the concepts uh, in, from the the, uh, from the capability cards for for uh, people that work in uh, operative settings. So the realization that we have is that crisis management is way too complex to to find a single most correct solution for the, for the problems that uh, these uh, the personnel faces. So the, the goal that we had in this uh, training package that we developed, developed was to help the personnel to increase their sense making of the situation uh, rather than transferring knowledge to them, uh, since they are experts in their uh, domain. Like uh, Mathieu uh, said in the beginning, that there are already a lot of resilient behaviors going on in uh, crisis management. So what we wanted to uh, do was to, with the help of the Darwin Resilience Management Guidelines, give the personnel a new kind of framework that they could use when they analyze the situation that they face. So what we wanted to do was to learn resilience by helping them shift perspective on how they view their uh, situation. and. Uh, we base that on uh, research uh, by Klein that uh, called cognitive learning, which is focused on how to change their mental models and uh, and learn and how to learn to see new thing, things to what's called perceptual discrimination skill to see things that maybe they didn't see before using the concepts that we learned. Then. Yeah, so like Jenny uh, just said, we used a combination of the different pedagogical concepts. Uh, we had uh, educational uh, sessions, we had training sessions, and we had exercises. And uh, the purpose of the, the program that we used was to successfully increase the complexity of the problems that uh, uh, the trainees were facing. And uh, throughout this package, I gave them access to uh, feedback so they could re uh, conduct self-reflection of what they have learned and how to apply it in their uh, operative setting. Uh, we can call that some kind of co-development. Uh, uh, we, we gave them a framework that they could themselves adapt in an operative environment. Yeah. So the main outline of the training package that we, we developed during uh, the pilot board looks like this uh, nice arrow here. Uh, and uh, then we will uh, go through these different set, uh, sessions in more detail. But uh, here's the, main, uh, the outline. So we started with some uh, educational activities, like, like a le lecture that we 
the helm that we talked about this, what Christian is. Uh, and then uh, we jumped right into more practical uh, training activities like a, a workshop uh, at ETX and then worked our way through up to a command post exercise. And then we had an after action review. But how do we get to here from the DRNG? You, I think you need to put the focus on this. I can do that, yes. Thank you. So, well, we start with uh, the capability card. So the first uh, objective that we had was to pick out which of the capability cards that we wanted to implement. So I think we used six of them, and that was the main bulk of what we used. Uh, and since the capability cards are on a national and domain uh, uh, generic uh, level, uh, so they are made from European level and they are uh, non-domain specific, we had to uh, do what we call a contextualization, where we took the capability cards and put them in the Swedish context in a healthcare domain. So that took uh, quite some work, actually. Uh, and the focus was to create uh, operative support for the, the healthcare uh, management staff that they could hold in their hand more or less uh, when they work. So the community cards went through this uh, transformation uh, that where we acted as policymakers, as KMC actually do, uh, with the support of us. Uh, to create the whole series. And uh, some parts from the capability cards was also directly in, uh, input to some of the sessions. For example, we used uh, some um, training questions more or less directly from the capability cards. Yeah. And I think we, yeah, here is contextualization. So here's a, a, a couple of questions that. Uh, you as a policymaker need to reflect on when you start to work with the DRMG. And, and the third one is which uh, or which part of the guidelines uh, that you need to start, start with and how they relate to the, the specific domain or situation because they work in different, somewhat differently. Uh, you also need to reflect on the current uh, understanding in your organization of what, in what level are we now that could uh, uh, affect. Uh, terminology was something that we work with because we have a, a standard terminology in Sweden that we need, needed to apply to the, the Darwin guidelines so they will fit in the operative uh, setting. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you want to add something or continue? Uh, I want to continue. I want to go to that line again. Um, we had those uh, steps in our uh, the, the arrow there. Uh, we started out with the lecture and as Jonas said, we started out with giving a short introduction to resilience uh, and to the uh, DR. Um, G <laughs> so, uh, for the participants and the participants and the, the target group as we call them is the medical command and control management teams here in uh, the region uh, of Stjötland managing the healthcare uh, when it comes to uh, crisis. Um, so this was the target group and we had the introduction and gave them a basic understanding of resilience and how the DRMGs related to current uh, practices and policies uh, of medical command and control. So that was the, the beginning after we have done the context evaluation, we started out with the lecture. Uh, during the second activity, the pre-TTX workshop, uh, the participants discussed three scenarios chosen to represent the variants of events um, Throughout the workshop, as you said, we were using the triggering, some of the tri triggering questions just to faci facilitate the discussion uh, uh, according to those scenarios. Uh, the next step is the tabletop exercise. Um, 
with the objective to provide an opportunity to apply and discuss the DRMGs uh, on a specific scenario uh, with the collaborational uh, actors. So not just the target group we're discussing and uh, taking part of the table top exercise, but also uh, actors as uh, the police, uh, the fire risk and rescue services, the Swedish Maritime uh, Administration. I thought it was those who were engaged in this tabletop exercise, and also members from uh, hospitals and pre-hospital settings, uh, according to this uh, scenario. Uh, the participants discussed, for example, when and how different organizations would collaborate uh, and identify potential uh, conflict of interests during this tabletop exercise. Yeah, of course. Yeah, so in the pre-tabletop uh, exercise workshop, we used, uh, like Jenny said, three different scenarios uh, with uh, quite uh, different scenarios. We had a, a cyber attack, we had, uh, I think, chemical, chemical out, uh, what break, you know, outbreak. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I don't, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't remember a lot of um, And during the tabletop exercise, we focused on a maritime accident scenario, uh, similar to the one that uh, re-emerged during the command post exercise. So, yeah. so I even just wanted to frame it like, we work with a maritime accident. Yeah. yeah. From that on, we were working with that scenario, yes. Uh, during the pre-CPX workshop, the target group um, discussed uh, the TTX uh, to gather lessons learned uh, and reflect on how the, the guidelines uh, would be applied in an actual crisis so that they get the chance to prepare themselves to the command uh, post exercise uh, in somehow. Uh, so we took the, the lessons learned from the tabletop exercise into the pre-CPX workshop. And then we are in the command post exercise. Uh, and the objective of that was to give the medical command and control management team the possibility to apply uh, the guidelines during a resilient demanding situation. We had a, quite a large scenario, uh, a maritime scenario. We have a ferry. Um, accident um, at the ocean outside of Östergötland and it was a, quite a complex scenario uh, develop, the, the uh, dynamic of the scenario was quite a complex uh, because we wanted to, to push the target group and the, the, the medical command and control team to make them use what they have learned from the lecture through their workshop and tabletop exercises and really perform those uh, learning objectives in that common uh, post exercise, giving the opportunity to do that as well. Uh, so the scenario really challenged the participants to, for example, manage school conflicts, uh, understanding crucial assumptions, being aware of constraints and using success uh, factors. Uh, during this uh, exercise. And the last activity uh, in the Syria, what Syria is uh, the post CPX workshop where we used the after action review uh, method uh, to gather the lesson learned and uh, both from the CPX but also from the evaluation of the contextualization of the uh, guidelines. So we use that in that uh, last ses session. Mm. Is there yeah. anything you want to add? Yeah, and, and uh, throughout uh, this uh, training package, we do the questionnaire evaluation, uh, both from a research perspective, but also from an educational perspective to get input of how the, uh, the audience uh, receive the information if, and the, if it was suitable for them. <clears throat> yeah, and I think one of the uh, feedback in of some, I think it was in the pre-CPX workshop, uh, 
one of the participants said like, ah, oh, now I understand, uh, finally. Uh, so, so I think that was a good feedback that showed that you need to do different kind of approaches. You need to learn the theoretical, but also you need to apply it yourself to really understand what the resilience perspective is about. Yeah. Can I ask a question there? Um, members of the public or the DECOP that want to read more about the results of, of this and the other pilots that have been performed during the Darwin project, are they in any of the deliverables? And if so will we be able to point them in the right direction? Well, the description of the pilot is in, in the deliverable, yes, but the results will be published in different articles, uh, hopefully. <laughs> You're Sorry. Your Sorry? We'll keep an eye on the, the Darwin homepage then for the, yeah. for the journal articles uh, that should be posted. And then uh, do we have the name of the deliverable where, it's, um, where the actual exercise is explained? Four point three. Uh, Three. Four. Yeah. Yeah. Four. Point four. Yeah. Yes. Was there a question as well? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think there was a question there. No. Was it Yvonne who wanted to say something? Yeah. Uh, Yvonne, did you want to say something there? Yes, it was a question about the after action review because uh, in, in resilience we talk about the after action review as well and I was a little bit curious how this was conducted in terms of what uh, went well and why things went well what were the surprises because all the exercises even you plan in detail there are some elements of surprise so I wonder if this was covered during the after action review because the after action review is known by many fields but maybe you conduct it in a different way uh, I'm not sure I can do, uh, give a de detailed answer on that question, but um, I think what we what we used during the in the uh, after action review after sorry I take that again an important input to the uh, after action review <laughs> review was uh, the data that was was collected during the CPX. We had a a broad coverage of the video materials and recorded since we used a uh, computer-based simulation as a basis for our exercise to do it in, in uh, real time uh, we had a lot of data uh, recorded that we used uh, during the after action review, review uh, as input for the discussion um, yeah i lost track of the question there, but uh, yeah, I, I don't think I can answer the exact methodology question. Maybe I can uh, make a reflection on that, because I think, uh, Yvonne, what you're um, asking is also how we conducted the exercise, and of course just managing the exercise is also a test of resilience, yeah. because there are unexpected events, unexpected decisions that the participants make, and we try to, to foresee everything, what they would do and have, for example, uh, um, someone that would answer the phone if they decided to call the military for help or something like that. But even though there were some, uh, some issues that we had to manage uh, during the, the exercise and, um, and um, uh, a valuable lesson from that is having people that can manage and make decisions in real time during the exercise. Uh, I think we, we, we did manage it so it didn't affect the outcome of the exercise or the, the participant didn't really notice at the time, but uh, that's a valuable point that it's also an experience of resilience for the exercise uh, managers. And, and like you said, yeah, uh, there, there were some problems during the, the command post exercise uh, and we had uh, a debriefing with uh, the command staff directly after the exercise where we discussed those issues. So the, in the after action review the focus wasn't on the, the simulation as such but more the resilient aspects of it rather than uh, doing a view of how well or how not well the command post exercise in itself 
network. So, so those questions was covered uh, actually before the after option review in a hot debriefing, just straight afterwards. Yeah. I think that Thank you. yeah, proper answer. Was that an answer to your question? Yes, thank you. And if I ask the same question to Luca, would you like to reflect on the pilots who've uh, participated in, in Italy? Uh, yes, here I am. Uh, so, I, especially if I, we were, we have, we had different surprises, I would say. Uh, if I refer to the pilot exercise one, the one I was uh, presenting before, more in detail, uh, one issue we had is that uh, the common post exercise was very smooth, I would say. Uh, people were very. Uh, also happy to, to participate and to show the way they, they would uh, work in such an emergency. Uh, but the moment after where we were simulating the meeting in which uh, roles and responsibility are discussed and also during the analysis of the brittleness, uh, it was more controversial because uh, since we were analyzing an official procedure, the execution of an official procedure, on which the airport company had uh, important responsibility, even if it was a procedure shared by more actors. Uh, it came out that uh, a European project uh, as such was not uh, the proper uh, place to discuss something which has an official value, so that uh, can cause sort of liability issues, like for example, uh, uh, the fire um, fighters uh, representatives were uh, willing to discuss about aspect of the procedures and uh, the airport managers were a bit afraid, okay, if this is discussed now and there is something important coming out, uh, it has to be official. So you, you really, it was, uh, and so she was not, uh, uh, the, the, the representative in this case of the airport were not uh, really uh, willing to to simulate uh, the entire exercise. I mean, they wanted to stop uh, a moment before. Like, uh, now it's becoming serious, so uh, be careful, because what we say now, it's, uh, we, we have to, to be liable for that, for what we say now. So, in that moment, we, were, we understood we were playing something very serious, and we also saw the disadvantage in this case of working in a very structured and formalized domain like uh, aviation is. Uh, because it is much easier to detect, uh, to spot deviation with respect uh, to a procedure which is uh, uh, quite uh, detailed. So uh, the way we managed it in that moment uh, at a methodological level was to speak about uh, other situation scenarios concerning the, uh, for example, smaller airports, which were far from the situation of Fiumicino there, uh, and, and it came out a very interesting uh, discussion. So people were able to identify a lot of uh, uh, fragilities, uh, potential fragilities in the emergency plan and way to manage them, which are quite, uh, quite interesting. Uh, and so we moved a bit uh, around the obstacle that uh, we were discussing about something very serious that was concerning that airport. But it was not easy, I have to say. So this is just uh, an example. Did you have any similar problems in the, the Swedish exercise? But I, I, like we discussed before, I think that the, the, the pilot four exercise was in some way conducted as a, like a like a normal part of your, your work yeah. uh, of uh, the crisis uh, and management, uh, what do you call it in Sweden? So I, I, I think there was a quite an open, uh, uh, there was a high roof in, in the discussion and people were uh, open to discuss uh, the actual problem because the, because the pilot was framed not as an European research um, program, but rather as an, more like a ordinary uh, educational program uh, yeah. within our context, I guess. Exactly. Yeah. So we also platform that, that some of the data we collected was not part of Darwin, but was collected as part of 
the Swedish prices uh, in view the development or what you call it. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have anything else to add on your from the no, I just uh, want to reflect on the the theory of uh, interventions. Uh, uh, with, as we have said, the the, the series with uh, the lectures, uh, the exercises, uh, the tabletop exercises, and command post exercises. It's it's quite a large amount of work to do if you want to implement uh, those guidelines in your organization, uh, and we think. Uh, that this structure is uh, a success factor, but maybe it it allows to be in a much smaller way uh, because you you have to consider which of the the cards you will will try to implement. Uh, at, at this time, we took all the six one uh, into this uh, interventions. Uh, maybe you can pick some, uh, and then you don't have to do it like this. Big, yeah, because it takes a lot of efforts, a lot of resources just to, to conduct this uh, series. Uh, and as we said at the command and uh, command post exercise, uh, we had a quite a large setup with techniques, uh, both from um, the digital version of NetSteam, but also with the analog uh, mobile train system uh, simulation tool. Uh, and I think maybe. It doesn't have to be that large, that big, to do this uh, setting. How many was involved? I, th I think we were like 50 persons involved in the uh, yeah, command post exercise. Just to manage, just to manage, manage the, the, exercise. the exercise. We had the counterplays, as you told us, from the, uh, from the military section, from the uh, National Board of Health and Welfare, and so on. Uh, and of course, the ship crews and uh, uh, pre hospital, pre -hospital staff. staff, police, uh, and so on. And maybe that's, maybe that's not needed. That depends, of course, on what you want to implement and what's the aim of the implementation. Yeah, but in our case, it was quite important to have that uh, such a big uh, setup since we wanted to do some kind of evaluation as well of the, the capability of the crisis management staff. Uh, yeah. Not just to educate, but also to do some kind of evaluation and to test how well the system actually works. Yeah. And then, and in those cases, you, you need to do a, a quite uh, realistic uh, exercise. Yeah. Can I just uh, stop you there for a second? I think we're touching a question that uh, has been asked. Um, excuse me, looking over my shoulder. But, uh, the question is, how will you use your experiences of setting up and organizing the fourth pilot in your future work? Um, so maybe you want to answer it as, as KMC and FY or what to elaborate yeah, well, I, can answer, uh, I think we, we learned a lot, a lot uh, regarding the methodology, how to conduct this kind of implementation of, uh, of high-level guidelines. I think that was very useful for us and uh, uh, to go through the whole process from these high-level guidelines to something that is uh, in operative use, that was accepted by the, uh, the people involved and they, they, they liked the idea and they started to use it in actual work. So that was a, a, a very good experience. Um, I think, and, and also, uh, yes, to to conduct this kind of, from from my perspective, a, a rather big exercise. I know from some other perspective it was not so big, but from my perspective it was uh, quite a big exercise. So I learned a lot from that. Yeah. And we must say we have feedback from a member of staff here at KMC who was part of of this. Uh, Pilot 4, who also stated that uh, knowledge learned from Pilot 4 has actually gone into real life experiences as well. Um, you will be able to read that interview with uh, with Rick Adrenaline on the Darwin homepage at, at a later stage. But so, so there is there is a, a proper use of actually performing the, the whole cornflower wind uh, exercise as well. But uh, Yanni or Kali, do you want to reflect on 
experiences and lessons learned and how that would be used in the context of K what's been done at KMC? Yeah, I think we will take a lot of the, the experience, but uh, the results from this, this work, I think we would be implemented in all of our courses at the KMC. We will uh, try to talk about resilience, uh, those uh, lessons learned about uh, uh, acting resilient into all of our courses. Uh, and the courses we are taking, uh, uh, setting up here is uh, uh, most of them are command and control exercises, educational concepts and courses. And I think they will suit in every of those courses. Cool. Yeah, yeah I, I, I'd like to add to that. I also think that even it's it's too soon to call it a golden standard, but I, I think it is a standard to do it this all in approach with this series that uh, we did here. Uh, it's a very interesting uh, experience, and um, as we have uh, seen, now uh, can be applied in real life situations. Uh, but what we also can do is in our day-to-day -day exercises, uh, try to uh, see where we could tweak the scenarios to challenge the participants to apply a resilient behavior or reflect on uh, where they could uh, be more resilient or um, uh, act in the way that we feel is beneficial for managing crises. So if I ask you then, uh, what would be your main uh key points for engaging participants? Uh, so I can start. Um, so I think it's always, uh, regardless if it's a live exercise or tabletop exercise or a workshop simulation, you want the participants to buy into the scenario. Uh, when you talk about live exercise, you uh, usually talk about the suspension of disbelief, like the when they participate, they feel that they make decisions as they would in real life, and they they see, for example, in in healthcare, they see a clinical situation that they try to solve. Uh, and the way to achieve that is to make the scenario relevant and the training relevant, so they understand why they participate. Uh, you should uh, adopt the, the challenge; it should be hard enough. If you're dealing with experts, you can't have a really basic scenario. So you have to try to find a way where they would be challenged, but not overwhelmed. Um, and uh, I think the, when you present the scenario, it needs to be concrete. So they, it's not so everyone has different opinions on what situation they're simulating. They're all on the same page. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, and also that they have a desire to succeed in the exercise that they, they buy in. But What's most important, uh, based on our, our experience here, is also to acknowledge that the, the competence that they already have in crisis management is, is resilient. They already know resilience, they just maybe don't know their words and, and call it resilience. So we need to acknowledge that and see what you could add to that by the training or exercises. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's uh, really important to know your target group and set the settings according to the target group, as you say. Uh, that's very important. I think also to, um, uh, to point out the, the importance of having collected the data uh, into an exercise so that it would be relevant and realistic. So you have to do your homework beforehand and uh, so you can keep up the, the participants' enthusiasm for um, taking part of the exercise and feed the exercise with the re relevant data according to time and, and so on. And that the decisions made in the, by the participants also have effects on the, the counterplay. So I think that is how you keep them involved in those exercises. If we uh, open up the, the discussion for, for everyone else participating, I know there are a lot of experts that uh, does anyone have any, any more opinion on that specific question? Vivon, you've had a few workshops going on. How would you say what's your most important key factor to engage participants? 
I, I think I, I not, do not completely agree with the be too attached with the scenarios and uh, the question will be back to you, Ioan, because you have the wedge group as a, a fictional city that things are happening because the point is to get uh, prepared and to see what is the existing resilience. I, I know the importance of the scenario to have something, some context to relate to, but uh, as, uh, all of you that participated in the in the workshop in in uh, in March, uh, that is more uh, like a, a city that something is happening and uh, how we are capable to, capable to to respond to that independent of the scenario. So, so if you have some reflection on that, <clears throat> what it was uh, in Brazil, what the participant aware is that for some of them, if we have an, a scenario that is not to relate to their expertise, it was difficult while the others that is very related to the area of expertise, uh, it, it was uh, very good. But in the oil and gas industry in Brazil, they saw a lot of possibilities to use the capability cars as a tabletop exercise for for disaster management. So, so they saw this relation. So, Ion, for you, if you have a lot of details on the exercise, low fidelity, high fidelity, what do you think about that? Uh, well, thank you. First of all, I'm glad we don't all agree because that would be a bit boring. <laughs> <laughs> I think, the, as Carla mentioned earlier, the, the four scenarios used and the in the DECO workshop at Wedgwood were, were very generic because we, we had such a widespread of expertise. Uh, Don, Neil, I would like to ask you in a minute with your reflections, but some of the, the feedback that we had was that uh, if, if, if a member of the DECO uh, participating had quite a small uh, sort of spectrum of expertise, they, were, they could find it difficult to adjust into some of the scenarios. Uh, that might always be the case, and that's possibly a weakness of, of what we were trying to accomplish during that workshop. We were trying to accomplish uh, expert feedback on all the capability cards by using very generic scenarios. They were extremely complex as well. But uh, overall, the, the feedback that we got uh, after the workshop was that uh, even though the scenarios were very complex, very worst case scenarios, uh, then most participants could always find uh, an angle in with their, with their experts and they felt they, they would have something to, to discuss and to, uh, uh, to share when they were in the, in the panel discussions. Uh, Donnell, I don't know if you feel happy enough or comfortable enough uh, commenting that, but you were at the workshop. Would you have any feedback on that comment? That's okay if you don't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yes, of course. Yeah, I think uh, there's different goals uh, to this, uh, different levels of uh, fidelity. Like in Pilot 4, we used also low fidelity um, uh, sessions or exercises, if you call it that, with the generic scenarios. Uh, but I think if you, uh, ah, Daniel's. Uh, Microphone doesn't work. Yeah, uh, but when you go to the level of the command post exercises and you want to gather empirical data, you need to go up uh, on a high fidelity level to actually to, to play it out in real time and to get do because in the in the high level discussion that we had with the DCOP, uh, uh, like like Kelly presented before, and uh, you. Uh, you are on a more theoretical or a speculative uh, level. On the, the fidelity level we had in the CPX uh, are on a, such a detail that you can say, does it really work at all? And, and when it works, how well does it work? And I think that's a, a, that's a, a different uh, topic. Uh, different, you know. So when would you... When do you feel, if I ask three of you, when should the actual context or concept of resilience management uh, be introduced in training? Can it be introduced at a very novice level? Or does it have to be resilience experts training in resilience management? What would you, what are your thoughts on that? I can start. Uh, so I think the, the experience that we have now is that we 
we introduced resilience to uh, subject matter experts. They already knew their field, so they were capable of understanding and reflecting how they could adopt resilience theory into their practice. So I think that was a success factor. But uh, so in in the setting that we used, uh, you should already have an expertise of your domain. And this is the setting of Comfort and the pilot. Yeah, that, oh, sorry, yeah, that's <laughs> uh, experience. But I think it's really interesting now if we can take the Darwin um, uh, collective experiences and try to find a way how we could introduce resilience into the, the training of new subject matter experts. Like when we, when we start from an August then you could add uh, resilience at the same time as subject matter expertise. But we haven't really tried that yet, so that's something that we're going to do. Any yeah. comments from No, that's that's what I think. Yeah, I, well. I, agree. I, I, yeah. I agree. I think uh, if you use the uh, resilience perspective, you can perhaps uh, learn to see things that you would miss otherwise, or learn to see things that maybe didn't make sense beforehand and uh, that perhaps seemed random, but if you apply a different perspective, it kind of makes sense. Uh, so I think you could apply it early on. But... Yeah. And if I ask you the same question, Luca, do you have any reflections on the pilots that you that you have performed? Was there a difference in the, uh, did you notice a big difference in the participants depending on the, the background and expertise? Uh, yes, there, there was a uh, quite big difference. I would say that uh, uh, it is important to distinguish three different types of views of, uh, of uh, also of our guidelines. One is the more like uh, fam familiarization awareness. So sometimes you need just to motivate, convince people of to think about uh, resilience and to apply these principles, which is quite different from training. When, when there is a training, it means that people are there already uh, more or less prepared to learn how to, to learn something new and uh, to try to use this principle. And then the moment of the implementations, like uh, the manager of uh, a given organization that decide to modify a procedure or a practice in his uh, organization because he wants to follow uh, the resilience management guideline. So it's, it's quite different and the baseline can be very different. It is clear in the difference also between the, some of the Italian pilots and the Swedish pilot that, uh, for example, in our case, we could not, uh, in most of the cases, we could not uh, um, get people uh, familiar before with the, with the capability cards, and with the guidelines, uh, because uh, the participant to our workshop were up <laughs> Very busy people uh, that uh, uh, were not. Uh, we could convince them to participate to a given event, a given day, focused on on Darwin and on the Darwin guidelines. But we couldn't ask them to, for example, study before the principles and uh, discuss internally to their organization how to use them. So our first goal was uh, really the fam familiarization with this concept and. The, uh, finding a way to motivate them to uh, to uh, change a bit also their mindset with respect to, to resilience. So you have to be prepared to that. If you uh, expect that people are directly using the principles and or uh, like also in a training learning uh, environment, uh, you may have uh, uh, bad surprises. So it's important to consider the different uh, baseline you are starting from. Thank you. And I know that uh, Juicy Mandarino, you are uh, going to be performing a, a workshop in Italy quite soon. Is this uh, uh, these uh, thoughts that you've been having from in your preparation, who your target audience? Do you have any reflections on this? Uh, yes. Um, first of all, I want to um, reassure the the claim that um, Luca was doing that uh, it was uh, I, it was very um, difficult to prepare for the pilots uh, the people to that have to participate maybe for the reason that they were uh, were uh, 
very high um, level um, representative of their organization and uh, uh, was very difficult to try to convince them that it was not a, um, it was a training but um, should have been done under the light of resilience which I in my opinion they didn't uh, even uh, think of that uh, because um, okay uh, because maybe they were not prepared they didn't uh, read the um, the literature that I was uh, uh, was have, was sent to them, but uh, nobody um, came prepared in that uh, in the light of uh, resilient uh, concepts. So I was not the one who prepared. The, I just assist. Um, I just uh, uh, were present to the, the pilot in ISS, and I remember that uh, there were um, big issues that came from that, and uh, that Luca. Valued and tested, and uh, so and uh, it was uh, made. We, we talk about this, but anyway, uh, talking instead about my, uh, but the, about the dissemination, uh, about the implementation of the um, guidelines, Darwin guidelines. Uh, in the we, we have we have this uh, conference, this meeting on the coming uh, Friday. Uh, which uh, will showcase uh, Darwin guidelines to the Italian National Health Care Service. And uh, for, to this purpose, we concentrated uh, the invitation to the local and regional uh, health care units and uh, um, to the direct, um, director, the sanitary director, health care director, and health care managers and uh, director generals. Uh, of the um, the regional uh, regional and uh, um, regional and some uh, and uh, city local uh, um, healthcare units, then to the uh, head of the department of emergency in the critical infrastructures of some of the main hospital in Rome, Milan, and. Some other city. Uh, we um, had uh, a feedback from uh, maybe uh, 25, 30 people. Let's see. And uh, we um, it's just a showcasing of what resi resilience concepts are to those people who work uh, under emergency, but uh, maybe. Um, they didn't uh, take the opportunity. They hadn't uh, the opportunity to see it under this uh, resilience uh, light perspective. And uh, in showcasing this, we have uh, also we will present a drill that has been uh, um, performed two years ago, uh, whose uh, virtual reality is uh, the maximum level because it was a, a real drill. Uh, it, it was made by um, an ISS uh, clinical governance expert uh, in the, at the Verona airport, and they simulated exactly the, the same pilot we had uh, in the pilot case last year, which is uh, the Ebola land suspect case coming from um, coming on a board um, on board on a plane uh, instead of Fiumicino it was uh, Verona airport and uh, mm, and in this occasion these people had the opportunity to uh, revise their protocol for uh, suspect case uh, uh, for, for uh, protocols for clinical and infectious risk so this uh, had a uh, this uh, main uh, purpose, but uh, um, it, it will be presented during this conference. And uh, we, um, we want to uh, present some uh, questionnaire to have feedback from the audience who will participate, which is uh, coming from different parts of Italy. And, uh, and this is for the dissemination and showcasing of uh, Darwin guidelines. Then we have, then in the afternoon, we will take the Darwin management uh, guideline, resilience management guidelines. Uh, will be um, 
present, uh, will be um, used uh, for um, um, for this uh, cap project that we have with the Western Balkans. Uh, to use the, this the guidelines as a module to be inserted in the um, in the master course uh, that we are um, planning to um, to create for uh, these four Western Balkans countries uh, who are not yet members European members and. Um, they don't have anything about uh, emergency courses at university level, so we will be very proud to introduce the Darwin uh, management, resilience management guidelines. Sorry. And uh, sorry. To, sorry, that sounds very exciting. I, uh, yes, I hope everything goes well. Those are two big jobs that you have. Uh, yes. And it's not finished here. There is only also another thing that we want to do a consensus co conference to see if you can uh, turn this uh, uh, Darwin Resilience Management guidelines into a best practice. Um, so we are following uh, this uh, perspective and in this direction and uh, trying to be present uh, and organize uh, a consensus conference and be present to the next uh, year. Uh, state um, uh, general state of uh, emergency which will take place uh, next spring and we will um, present uh, this uh, these guidelines i must rephrase uh, good luck with your three big projects yeah that sounds very, <laughs> yes. very very interesting and uh, thank you for that thank you thank you uh, matthew you have a question I do. Um, so the the I really liked uh, the what uh, the presentations I saw. I mean, some of that I was familiar with, but not all of it. So it was very interesting. One question I had was uh, you know, we while using a lot of uh, work. I mean, sorry, exercises, uh, common post exercises, and 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 uh, equivalent. It has a strong uh, focus on responding to an event, right? So we are, we are looking at the operational management of a particular event, and um, uh, which is, a, of course, a, a very key point and a very important part. Um, how I was wondering in your mind, it might be a difficult question, but how the the, the sort of insight gathered during while responding to an event in these simulations or exercises how that translates potentially for organizations into activities that they conduct on a regular basis in their organization to enhance forms of re resilience, to reflect on their resilience, to identify brittleness, to change things. I mean, the, the, the other things basically that I try to touch on uh, in the guidelines. How, how is that, that transfer uh, of, uh, part of it is a mindset uh, issue, like you were saying, uh, Jonas. Uh, how's, how does that transfer from testing and exercises to to that to the regular activity of the organization? Well, um, so to my knowledge, I think uh, the experience from the Swedish Marine uh, system in the English name, the Maritime uh, Rescue something administration. Uh, administration, I think. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. That was uh, 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 participating in the tabletop and uh, I think there was a lot of uh, experience that they took with them uh, at home and to, to use in uh, projects that they had to increase the collaboration between the maritime uh, side and the healthcare side. Mm -hmm. So I think it had an effect on how they uh, work together. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, but I think it's a good point that you're making, Mathieu, that when you do a command post exercise, you mostly focus on the during phase and maybe the after if you do a proper after action review. Uh, but what that feeds back into is an understanding that it is important with the uh, preparations also, for example, common ground establishing networks and so on. So 
I think it's even if you start in the middle, you will receive benefits on the uh, preparation. Um, yeah. The before, the before phase. phase. Yeah, yeah. But I think in addition to that, that I think a point that uh, we we want to make with the big arrow that's still in the background is that you cannot just do the command post. You need mm -hmm. to do the pre-command post workshop. You need to do a tabletop beforehand to find out all the things that you need to have in place before you can actually manage the event. Because the, the command post exercise here is uh, is, an, is a simulated event, so. Every, all the sessions before that is in the before phase, so to say. So, Yvonne, uh, I think you have a comment to make on that. Uh, yes, because uh, in, in Norway, in the oil and gas industry, this command and control is not as wide as used. And when we have the workshop in Brazil and with the oil and gas, they said that they could use the in the regular exercises, in the emergency preparedness exercises. And what we did, it was to discuss the, the capability cards, the ones that card prepare and you show, that we discussed all the phases before, during and after. So they saw great potential on discussing all these phases and use on their regular training activities. Matthew, was that uh, an answer to your question, or do you want do you have a further follow up? Yeah, uh, good. Yep, yeah, good answers. Yep, yeah. interesting. Okay, do we have any other any other questions from any other participants? I have a reflection. Yeah, of course. Uh, regarding what Lucia and uh, Eustace said, that it's hard to get people to read beforehand. I think there was the experience uh, from our perspective uh, during the DCOP that uh, uh, not everyone has the uh, possibility to read so much before they come to these kind of uh, sessions. And I think the lecture that we had in Pine 4 was very important to actually to serve the participant here, you sit down for two hours and you will get to know not everything that you need to know, but some part of it. And the, rather than sending out materials beforehand and hope that they will read it, but most people have a lot to do. So do you feel this has to be done? If I if I want to use it in my organization, do I have to have a lecture on on the DRMG and Darwin the thoughts of Darwin before or can I and I actually lift one concept card from the 13 and say, okay, we're going to have a, a tabletop low fidelity exercise, but we're going to discuss this topic uh, because this is something we feel we need to talk about in our organization. Well, I don't want to answer that in, in a specific organization, but I think uh, experience uh, that I bring with me from this pilot is uh, that it's very helpful to do the to set the DRG in the national domain specific context and then to have a, like a lecture rather than just reading the uh, guidelines directly but that depends on what level you are the, in the pilot four we was on an operative level not on a, a management level or a, or a policy making level so i think it depends on which level you are implementing the guidelines in. In our case, on operative level, we had to do the transformation from a high level level to the operative level. So, yeah. And I sometimes I can foresee the future. I'm actually going to turn to you. I know this is <laughs> just to, to I'll let you complement this. Uh, be careful, there is a bit of echo. And uh, that, uh, yeah, you are right that it depends. Uh, who is the target of your guidelines, the main target you are referring to. Uh, but in order to involve, for example, uh, um, front-end operators, uh, so also people that are not uh, top level in the organization, you need the commitment uh, of your uh, organization institutions. So what I wanted to say before uh, was, that was, of course, it's better if people can read and familiarize before with the material. Uh, but it is not only that, it is also that the same kind of exercises like the one we did in Darwin can be used for different purposes. So one is to try to motivate, to convince uh, also uh, institution, uh, uh, important institution that are dealing with critical infrastructure 
to commit in this kind of, uh, of uh, mindset of resilience way of thinking, which is a different level, different step compared to really uh, using it, implementing it. But it, it is uh, as important as implementing it, because if you don't uh, make them familiar, if you don't uh, make them committed to do it, you don't arrive to the implementation, never. You don't arrive even to the training. So it is important uh, to, to understand this uh, difference in the, in the baseline. And our experience is that once uh, they participated uh, to, the, to the exercises, even with the limitations uh, we have been telling also with, uh, with Juzi, uh, they are quite uh, convinced that this is uh, uh, worth uh, doing. And, and we, we also had uh, this uh, additional experience I didn't mention in the, of applying the, uh, some of the cards uh, in the highway domains in, uh, in the north of Italy in, um, in an exercise in Bologna uh, hosted by the Red Cross. And it was quite, uh, quite strange then that uh, we, we also felt a bit uh, sort of guilty for that because during summer uh, an accident occurred and it was a very severe accident that occurred uh, exactly in the same place where we are imagining the, the scenario. So it was not uh, a small aircraft uh, falling down on the highway. It was uh, a big truck uh, uh, bringing uh, gas that crashed in the, into another truck and caused a major uh, fire accident uh, on the highway. And it was exactly in that, uh, in that point. So I, I cannot say that we were happy of having done uh, this exercise there, of course, but uh, uh, we, we discussed it afterwards with some of the organizers and uh, at least uh, uh, we hope we, we give a little contribution to get uh, these people also more motivated, more prepared. We know that, uh, uh, that um, also the management of the emergency, especially by the um, the police forces and the fire brigade uh, was very effective considering the size of the accident. Uh, so we really felt that uh, we were doing something that has a uh, very strong link with reality, unfortunately, in this case. Uh, but still, uh, uh, for example, in order to organize that, uh, that event, uh, it was not so easy at the beginning because you had to convince the managers of different uh, private and public institutions. Uh, and it is not uh, so straightforward to convince them this is not uh, your ordinary work. You have to do something slightly different that will influence your normal way of working, but it's still an exception in your, uh, with respect to your ordinary uh, way of uh, working. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so I think quite a few of us have seen the pictures from that accident of the actual explosion. We understand why we should be prepared. Uh, that's yeah. a good valid point. Thank you, Luca. Uh, I'd just like to mention what we actually have done for in the Darwin project as well. That there, we have had a previous wiki, um, previous webinar rather, uh, on the Darwin wiki, and Matt, uh, Matthew's participating today as well. It does give an explanation of how to navigate the wiki and that can be a way of uh, making yourself prepared before an event as well. So an aid and uh, you can have a lecture or it could also be aiding through through um, work that's actually done in the project. Um, do we have any other questions at all? So we do have one, there's one more written question and it's on contextualization that you were mentioning uh, in the pilot four scenario uh, there's a lot of job or a lot of work done on contextualization into a healthcare aspect and that's also been done in the project for for uh, for aviation uh, is this something the question is is this something that the darwin project can can help the DCOP with uh, we can't obviously translated and uh, into domains that we don't understand. But uh, this could also be a, a wider question to to uh, the consortium members that are here. Is this a way forward for the future DCOP to actually to aid organizations in a, in a specific context? And sharing experiences and also guidance on how to adapt uh, into different settings. You're not going to answer no, but. <laughs> 
any reflections from uh, from Yvonne, maybe? I think the contextualization can be inspired by the by the work that was done in healthcare and aviation that how they it was adapted or not adapted and how the concept cars were adaptable for the different critical infrastructures and it will be very interesting to pop, uh, have uh, more examples on how this can be how we can populate the wiki with other uh, with other critical infrastructures or from examples from the from the healthcare that maybe Daniel will be involved with or other people and share experiences in the wiki with this uh, with this with this work. Mm. I don't know if it's a sufficient answer. Yeah, no, I would, I would say so. I think we would agree agree yeah. to that on this here as well. Uh, uh, we could just mention what, what 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 the plans are for the future. The the DCOP that are present here today. Uh, all of you, I recognize your names. All of you have actually answered the, the, the DCOP questionnaire. One of the questions in that questionnaire is if you want to have a coordinating role and be an active part in the, in the future DCOP. Uh, so what will be happening now is that we will uh, uh, we will um, uh, organize a meeting for you and we will discuss together with the, the Darwin partners how we facilitate the future DCOP and what role we should be, be playing in keeping the DRMG uh, alive and sound and a good knowledge base for, for resilience management. Um, if there aren't any other final questions at all, do you have any final remarks? Um, yeah, maybe one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, one reflection I have when listening to my colleagues here and online uh, is that it's really important of understanding your, your target audience and the constraints that you might have in time or money or uh, yeah other constraints but making an effort to to start anyway to to do at least a teaser as uh, uh, Luca mentioned um, that if they they start they get interested and I think any way to to initiate the process of understanding resilience is good so you don't have to do it all at once you could ease into it. Uh, I think that's a recommendation from, from our experiences. Yeah. Any final remarks? From... Yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, to ease into it, I don't think uh, you should try to apply all the guidelines at once because it's uh, quite a uh, comprehensive endeavor. Uh, so I think you need to start a little bit smaller than that. Um, since you, when you start to add on more guidelines, it's getting it's getting complex pretty quickly. Yeah, and it's important to it be important to stress that the idea of the DRMD is not to to uh, remove all every all existing guidelines. No. If you have a if you have an organization that's functioning, then of course you can you can choose yeah. topics. And I think that's an important remark to make that these guidelines are not just meant to be implemented as is. They are they are guidelines to uh, adapt or create new guidelines to adapt uh, existing guidelines or create new ones, not just to take the RMG and put it in uh, use as they are. Yes. Uh, Luca, any final comments from, from the south of Europe? Uh, just uh, notifying that there is uh, perhaps a comment by someone in the chat. Maybe yes. I'll read that. Yeah. You can comment first, and then I'll read Donald's comment in a second. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, nothing. Nothing. Uh, no. No special uh, comments beyond <laughs> <laughs> what uh, what uh, I already said. Uh, so. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Daniel, I'll read your comment out loud, as I know you're having problems with, uh, with your microphone. In our organization, the Red Cross, we had several healthy discussions based on the concept cards. We are now in the process of developing training for volunteers. It's been helpful going through the different perspectives, selecting questions, also reminding about before, during and after perspective. 
And I would say, yeah. I would say, if we don't have any other comments, then that's an excellent feedback to the Darwin project. I would think we can all be very happy that that the Red Cross have adapted it in that way. Um, in that case, I think we'll say thank you very much. Um, thank you for everyone that's been here at KMC, Jumnasi and uh, Karoskar, and thank you to everyone that's been taking an active part. Um, much appreciated, and uh, this webinar will be posted on the Darwin homepage at a later stage. So if you feel it's been interesting, if you know that you have colleagues or partners that uh, like to learn and listen to this, then please spread the word. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us today, and uh, speak to you all soon. I just like Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Luca. Bye, bye. <laughs>